Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Nature Folklore Sessions. It's 4th of September, 2022. Well, thank you for joining me for our weekly time of exploring nature centered folklore, connecting this within your favorite sanctuary space, and expressing inspired visions from your sanctuary through your poetry, writing, arts, craft, performance, and even problem solving. Now, this uh, it was going to be part one, but this is our only part of harvesting an apple folklore series. And I've got some Avalon stories as well. And that's getting rid of me. And there you go. You've got uh, the tour of Glastonbury with the apples below. So that brings the two together, the the apple folklore and the Avalon stories. Our guest today, we've got one guest, uh, B. Smith. Uh, she sent us a video in. Um, so uh, I'll talk about that when we get closer to the time. Um, now, these nature sent of uh, nature folklore uh, sessions, videos, uh, tree and water sanctuary support. They're all brought to you due to the support of our kind subscribers and some subscribers already with us watching live today or be joining us later. So thank you for your continued support. Without it, I couldn't fund putting on this show and share it with you today. But I'm still still not covering the weekly and annual expenses. I have moved into uh, Lister Dannon and I've been frantically moving into a corner of the living room here. I'm not going to dare show you the living room. It's absolute chaos from all the stuff I had to move from the corner to throw into the rest of the living room. But if you can help be a subscriber, there it is there. Now, I did some fiddling around on the Patreon. If the Woodland Bard doesn't work, just put in Nature Folklore instead. I'm going to check which one it is. So it's either uh, patreon.com, Woodland Bard. If that doesn't work for you, try Nature Folklore. One of them will work. So thank you very much. But uh, Patreon goes through PayPal. And if you're not a very happy uh, person with PayPal, you prefer a card. I'm also on buymeacoffee.com, uh, Nature Folklore, and they just take cards. So anything that you can do, a pound a euro, a dollar a week, it helps me to keep the show on the road. So many thanks for your help. Extremely uh, appreciated, and I trust you'll find value from these sessions. I've been hearing from people who've actually been going back to old sessions and working through them again. So very honored about that. <laughs> I'm quite embarrassed. You know, obviously, I've tried to improve over the sessions. Anyway, let's see uh, what who, lovely guests are with us already today. Claire's on board, which is lovely. Good afternoon. Looking forward to the broadcast. Lovely. And Terry uh, is here. Uh, Terry Slack Hardwick. Lovely to see you. And I look forward to the people that uh, may be joining us soon. Uh, at the moment here in Lister Dannon, we've got a lovely sunny warm sandwich in between heavy rain that happened through the night up till dawn. And then I gather from dusk, we're going to get another load dump on us as a second wave of rain comes in. But it's beautiful now. And I would think most of Ireland are out and about getting this wee bit of extra sun because we've had some lovely sunny days again recently, which is uh, fantastic. I know people are catching up on gardens this afternoon. I've heard from one or two regulars that are doing that. Anyway, it's September, and through this month, people in Ireland and in many countries, they're harvesting their apples, or will be. It's a little bit early now, I suppose, for most people. But this is usually the month of uh, apple festivals, but I've only seen two advertised this year, although maybe some of them are a bit late to put their information up. Um, so uh, I imagine there are going to be, like Clock Jordan's one example, they have a big one on, but I haven't heard a whisper. So maybe some of these people are going to put them on last minute. Drama Hair is another one in Leitrim who does one. Uh, the two that I know of that's coming up is the Clonmel Apple Fest. They're well and truly in production. That's in Tipperary, a big area for apple because it's a cider making county. And also the Apple Day at the Organic Center in Leitrim. They're not promoting it yet, but I did ask them and they said, yeah, we are doing it. We're just about putting the 
brochure together now. So I haven't got that, but more about these soon. Now, a question I often ask myself is, could the apple tree be the tree of life rather than an oak or ash? Now, that is quite some profound statement, isn't it? Um, let's give a bit of a picture support on that. I've got a few photos today. There we go. There's a tree of life uh, photo there. Um that's uh, around um there we go uh, the tree of life wonderful and uh this and other stories i'll mention this afternoon are from my uh, book the bathing of the phase breath because there's quite a a chunk on apple it's there on uh, apple mythology and folklore and now the idrisil uh, many of us know in the north mythological tales as being the tree of life and this, they believe in that's where the origin of life was born from. There's an artist impression of Idrisil. Now, maybe to present this more simply, the tree of life, uh, let's say, uh, the, it's said to be the creation of the universe, the origin of humanity, and the divine gifts of nourishment. Now, Norse tales seem to tell that all life starts from the ash tree. And here's a Norse ash tree variation. Um, and they say that uh, they have this reverence for the ash tree, believing in the mythological association with water. And certainly I know some ash trees by water. An example of Holy Well I'm going to be given later on. That has an enormous ash tree over it. And then when I went looking at wells uh, through Leitrim, there was one that I went to. Unfortunately, the old vintage veteran ash tree had fallen down. I haven't got a photo this time. I'll, I'll have that next time. Uh, so there are ash trees, uh, ash trees, ash trees. And, uh, but normally I tend to associate uh, the willows and the alders being by water. But there we have it. The mythology of the ash trees because they're a much more chieftain tree. And uh, now Celtic tales, they, uh, they vary a bit. They talk about the oak as being uh, the life source and perhaps because of the sturdy and deep rooted presence of oak their tap roots really go way down and storms just will not knock them down very easily and the oak name itself has associations to the druid name druid being uh, uh, an ancient name related to oak so druid is something we hear a lot of these days isn't it now some of the other traditions they tell of other trees as being the bringers of life on earth but several traditions tell of life being brought to earth by the apple tree and that's why i'm saying is this the tree of life and uh, the apple uh, e fruit itself being the bringer of life even if they're golden apples because a lot of the tales coming from the middle east etc they seem to have golden apples even the greek tales have golden apples and there is a bit of symbolism of golden apples. I'll talk about that a bit later. Now, examples are traditions and stories from China who relate to a tree of life of the apples, or uh, also anywhere in the Orient, and ancient Persia, and all this coming along the Silk Road. And uh, the one thing about Silk Road, that's where we got a lot of our apple species going because it was a survival food. The merchants going along the Silk Road, they actually did plant apples along the roots. Uh, as a way for other travelers to be able to take advantage of that. And that's, uh, in a way, a lot of the apples we've got around the world, we can thank to the species that were growing along the Silk Road. Also, uh, Eastern Europe, I've been talking about with crumbs from the Balkans to the Baltic. That was also, uh, apples were well within their culture as uh, life bringers and and. Of course, that went northwestwards along the Danube and uh, from the Baltic going westwards through uh, what is now Poland into Germany and especially the former Saxon country, um, Holstein, isn't it? The Holstein area between Denmark and Germany. Um, now, I love apple tree uh, tradition tales, the, the tale of pure healing waters. Um, let's give you this one. There's a, a sort of nice Arctic, um, Arctic uh, artist impression of uh, trees, apple trees with water. So tales of apple trees very connected to pure and healing water springing from deep below 
and through the apple tree roots the water pours out through the roots there's some very stories talking of that especially north uh, north saxon stories more than anything saxon germanic um polish as well now the water pools around the apple trees are told of as being the entry points of the giving and protection from the nymphs fairies the fae and now she and now for this when we're talking about nymphs uh, we're, to, we're really going into greek mythology there uh classic greek myth tales talk about the nymphs but they are also told through persian and balkan tales too um it's funny sometimes i look for photographs and other times they just won't go down uh, and well here in ireland scotland wales and through rural england too we talk of and have reflective reverence for fay trees rag trees uh clouty trees there we go that's uh is that by the case well i think it is yeah um sometimes we call the trees that, that we hang the rags and clouties on as being wishing trees and we may try to make our wishes from leaving a gift or something made of, of metal unfortunately um, beside the sacred well, sometimes people throw the metal into the well. So sadly, these gifts are often too, they're banged in the tree. And look, at that's an awful example. I don't know if you can clearly see that, but that's a, a whole branch. It's not, it's not a branch uh, with grooves like bark would be. That's all coins. Uh, and of, uh, that's by a well where the, they've all been nailed in to the trees. And most people in Ireland are familiar with leaving uh, wishes at healing wells. What in Ireland? This is more like it. Uh, woven stuff. Leaving or leaving a bridge's cross is one of them. I haven't got a bridge's cross hanging, but these are the sort of things by tradition that should be hung on a tree uh, by the well. But that got uh, overtaken by cloths and ribbons, silks. Uh, leaving uh, rosary beads and and then uh, recently in the last 20 years it's amazing how much plastic yeah you know, there is that tradition that uh, you're doing a prayer of healing wishes either for someone close to you or even yourself uh, I always feel if you put the plastic up you're kind of condemning the person because it said that when the thing that you hang or put there fades away that is the healing the long-term healing being active and when it's faded away the healing job should be done uh anyway uh, talking i'm talking about wells a lot with this so it's a good time to announce a side project a side project to nature folklore uh before i do that let's check uh, your comments uh, see what's coming up there's cliff Gar here apples are sacred to a so on midnight ceremony where we pass those left to the realm with them i'm actually going to talk a section about that so thanks for bringing that up cliff and we'll be talking about that especially uh, a tradition when i was a child and a dawn they're sent down the river hoping that they grow to life from a rebirth for the spirit that may you know apples are so on that's absolutely beautiful that really brings it into context so that's wonderful thanks very much for that cliff and i'll be talking a little bit of a variation from that um terry slack reminding she's from uh, maryland which is uh, beautiful thanks very much so um right and uh, now talking about this new side project in native folklore holy wells revival and uh, let's bring up a, a bit of a there we go that, that's actually from the cache well which uh is still one of the nicest i've been to just because it's uh it's so incredibly natural it hasn't been it's kept as it has with a sort of rough boulders around it and it's a beautiful springy well it's just fresh the whole time very good to drink from not too much going on around it absolutely gorgeous and there's the sun reflecting on it so there we go i think that's a good uh, picture to really bring about this new side project nature folklore holy wells revival is what i'm calling it now i say uh holy wells uh because um most people are familiar with that name rather than the other names we use such as natural springs spring wells sacred wells blessed wells all various but i think holy wells is more familiar name now some people they define wells as being 
the spring wells that have been venerated by Christian saints. There's a lot of Patrick wells around, a lot of Bridget wells around, and then the lesser known saints have their own, like St. Hughes, uh, St. Fekin, all those people. But those wells, you know, they're much older than the saints. They've been around for thousands to millions of years. I'll go back. That's uh, looking inside the bubbling of the cache well again. And so they've been, that well's been doing that for thousands of years from deep underground, well before the saints trod this earth uh, and commanded or attracted their reverence through the wells. Now, I like to think of the word holy coming to us from a pre Christian origin. And um, from a word that's generally pronounced, and Cliff sort of brought this up in a way, it's from a word that's pronounced either as howl or hail. And that and similar words travel through language and culture up from the Balkans to the Baltic and then east uh, and passed on from the Slavs uh, who, Slavs who moved in between Denmark and what's now Germany became what's known as the Saxon culture. Uh, in Holstein, as I mentioned. Now, uh, Hal and Hale, Hale, Hale words, they arrived in the UK and Ireland, just like that, through the Saxon, and even came in through Dane and Norse cultures as well. And these are words, Hal and Hale and Hale, describing, I suppose loosely translating over to English, they're describing whole, wholeness, and also uncontaminated as well. And later, these words got became changed, they extended into describing health, happiness, and even drinking a toast of good cheer. I'll be talking about wassail in very soon. Uh, but wassail is a seasonal blessing, and even what Cliff was talking about a little while ago, that's kind of a lead up to that, a, a tribute to apple trees. And uh, with the revival part of the Holy World's revival, that's the uh, side dish, of, her, of uh, nature folklore, it's inspired by what seems to be a, f a new flood of interest in reviving holy wells, especially within Ireland during this year, I've noticed. And I thought this uh, may be, you know, initially I thought, oh, this is me recognizing, uh, you know, I am uh, my own interest in uh, holy wells as I'm revisiting them. I used to visit them a lot, but I've been going around. If you've been following me on Facebook, I've been putting quite a few up from her visits lately. And I thought I might be recognizing the popularity due to me just going around to the wells. But no, I see this has wor been working in tandem. I must have picked up on the slack and the vibe of it because holy and sacred wells have really taken on a new interest. It's a really a lovely revival, I think. So through the summer, there seems to be, as I say, a springing up. One thing that I've seen spring up is county-based exploration. Uh, initially, a lot of the county projects, they're, they're just taking photographs, or ar archiving, they're trying to find the wells, they're talking to locals who often lift up a, a fallen hawthorn or a tree or an overgrown shrub, and they lift it up, boom, there's the pool, there it is. Nobody's visited for 20, 30, 40, 50 or more years. Um, so people are returning to the ancient holy wells. Some of them are actually reviving, picking up clean water, obviously uh, revisiting the wells for contemplation, and also for meeting others within calm surroundings. And there seems to be a lot of government funding too. This is why these county projects are set up. Uh, different agencies in Ireland have been helping out lately, Leader uh, and uh, Heritage Council, they've been helping out a bit, funding the county projects. Also, I'm personally hearing and seeing much more about holy wells and blessed wells and pools from around Europe. Uh, Cliff, familiar with the one we featured uh, in the Wirral there. Uh, quite a few in the UK. There's some lovely pic uh, ones in pick country up in Scotland. But we're hearing more about Europe. Go to um, Estonia, absolutely full of holy wells there and, and around the world. So I'm serving, actually, in two Sundays' time, I'm going to serve a special nature folklore edition on the 18th of September, uh, two Sundays' time. And it's going to be at the later time of 4 p.m. on a Sunday. I was trying to make this 4 p.m., but uh, it got listed at 2 p.m., so that's why I'm here on a regular time. But I'm moving, thanks to poll, result, poll results, where you have stated you will prefer two hours later. So that's what I'm going to try out. 
And uh, so uh, in two summers, the 18th, it's going to be called Holy World Revival Introduction. And I will share in tense the work done so far, also the website and what you can share with the project too. So meanwhile, um, I'll get back to apples in a moment, but could you help me out by subscribing to the new Holy Wells Revival YouTube channel? It hasn't got its own proper name yet because it needs more subscribers before I can use the name. So I'll put a link after the show uh, in the comments. If you could help me out through that, uh, I'd be highly appreciated to get that uh, channel on the road as well as this well-established nature folklore one. And uh, what I'm going to be doing, there's going to be separate Holy World Revival shows on Thursdays. They're going to be sh much shorter than these nature folklore ones, probably about 30 minutes on a, a Thursday evening. So thank you uh, for subscribing, not only to uh, the uh, nature folklore channel, but on YouTube, the Holy World's Revival channel. Probably if you do a search for Holy World Revival channel, you'll probably get it. Okay, let's, uh, before I get back to apples and apple mythology, let's see uh, what we got in this cliff here. I failed to mention the apples have passed into the stream from a nearby spring. Wonderful, the way it should be. Thank you. And uh, Terry saying it's lovely to hear of this ceremony. Uh, wonderful. This really put the foot in the right place. Uh, excellent, Cliff. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Getting back to apple traditions and relating to the blessed and holy wells too. I'm going to be talking a bit more of that. And now I'm really passing to a later part of the year because people used to pass, used to hang apples as well on the side trees. Um, but this is seen more in rural England. Uh, but it's fading out there now. But this seems to have come from saxon traditions and i'm talking about side trees being trees next to the wells and the clouty and rag trees and also there are isolated wishing trees that not necessarily by water sometimes they are by a stream or a river or a lock even but uh, the hanging of apples uh, for wishing good luck used to be quite a thing now i have heard of coins now i showed you the coins being put into the tree beside the water now i've heard of coins being placed into the apples that are hung from these uh, wishing trees from the sacred well side trees as well i've never seen it myself but these are stories that i've been told so but thinking about that uh, coins and apples where else have you seen apples and coins hanging from a tree good clue there's usually a fairy on the top, <laughs> and although these days it's more like uh, a star or an angel, isn't it? Now, apples, of course, uh, in that tradition, the big C tradition, have been replaced with baubles, and the coins are usually made of chocolate. Uh, do I have something on that? Uh, I should have something uh, on... There we go. There we go. And just in case you haven't forgot, that is actually a chocolate coin. Coin, and there's a bauble on the right. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Uh, whether the Apple Festival is happening in Ireland uh, is the return of Apple Day at the Organic Center. Uh, I'll give you an idea. It's in Leitrim. It's, it's pretty much on the border of Leitrim, just going into Fermanagh. If you look on that map, it shows Organic Center there. I haven't really got any details of that, unfortunately. Um, but uh, Rossinver is north of Manor Hamilton in County Leitrim. They're having their Apple Day on the 25th of September. Uh, I think it's from noon till four. I'm actually going to be going there. And uh, because the Nature Folklore is broadcast or will be broadcast at 4 p.m. from then, it gives me plenty of time to go there for a couple of hours, whiz back here, and then broadcast you a bit later so of course uh, as they haven't brought out the brochure and videos uh, this is photos i took at a past apple day i went to so there we go there's maureen there talking about a species of apples as while well, selling her duck and and geese eggs as well and what we got here leitrim actually has species of apples and they're beautiful apples especially the leitrim red ones that one top right they're absolutely delicious uh so there's those, and uh, they make lots of apple juice. The demonstrate. I haven't got anybody 
picture of people demonstrating, but they certainly make a lot of apple juice there and you can buy some apple juice pretty cheaply and even buy cases of the stuff. And it's actually their own apples because they have their own apple orchards and there's tours of the apple orchards and that's a litre in red there. They grow very abundantly there uh, up uh, in the organic centre. Wonderful orchard. And always the trees are always abundant crop just like that and uh when you're on tour there's someone always gives you a, a nice wee talk and demonstration of grafting how to graft uh from trees and, and make your own get your own going in your home and then you get a tour around the organic gardens the organic center gardens they give you that and uh, there's cr uh, baking and craft stores galore and there's corn dolly making and other crafts going on uh, there you go. And uh, one of the lovely things is uh, ha having a lunch or a snack in the, oops, in the grassroots group cafe, which is delightful. And here is someone serving food outside, uh, one of the people that was at the grassroots cafe at the time. Or after all that, you can go for a walk to the nearby Fowley Falls, which is absolutely gorgeous walk. Uh, multiple waterfalls as you go up and they get bigger and bigger and uh, here's the sort of size they get to uh, uh, poor man he looks like he's covering his ears from the sound of it uh, so yeah it's a lovely day out as well uh, so that's um, that's all I can tell you about the organic center if you happen to be in Ireland at the time organic center apple day um, Right, let's get on to talking about Adam's apple. There's a nice bit of mythology for you. Now, did Adam in the Bible's Genesis book actually eat an apple? That's a big question. Now, the Garden of Eden story is told, it's not exclusive to the Bible. It's actually told by a few religious books. Um, if I can get the uh, computer to behave, there you go. I think that's the one I want. Uh, no, it isn't. But that'll do for now. Adam's apple. Uh, that's the one I want. And there we go. That's the uh, typical sort of fall of man sculpture, isn't it? Uh, anyway, but today, it seems most of us assume that the forbidden fruit of temptation that was told about in the Bible for a start was an apple. But I gather the, uh, the apple <laughs> the apple was never actually mentioned in the Bible. Not in the earlier translations, anyway. Now, the illusion of the apple connection in the fall of man story seems to be motivated by 16th century Renaissance painters. Now, these painters, they were quite well into Greek mythology and other mythologies, and uh, a lot of inspiration came to sculptures and painters in the Renaissance time from the Greek arts, and a great inspiration to them was the Greek mythology Garden of Hera. And, but they translated this mythology into Christian-based stories because it was the Christian market that was actually what was their customer base. It was their patronage. And it's where they look for payment uh, so they could have their own food and shelter and survive. So they took their passion of the Greek mythologies, even Persian mythologies, and made them uh, convince people that they were in the Bible when they were not, because at that time, very few people could read anyway, so they couldn't confirm whether they were in the Bible or not. Uh, and often the sort of things they did was nude women holding an apple. This was a popular subject of the Renaissance sculptures and the painters too, and various uh, male sculpture artists and storytellers. The reason they did this is they seemed to compare the shape of women's breasts to apples. Anyway, also, um, when they cut an apple along, I, I've often talked about cut an apple along the side and a star will appear. But a lot of people, they cut down from the core downwards. And, and then and this uh, was an inspiration, apparently, to these artists. You cut down the apple core. And uh, there's comparisons made to a woman's vulva and maybe the uterus. And uh, this is my daughter-in-law's representation of two apples in the uterus, a painting that she did. Uh, so anyway, that's fantastic. Now, some say this expression came from male artists after their visions were amplified 
after they drank cider or maybe mead. And no, I hadn't drunk cider or mead before doing the show either. And But even in the Greek stories, you know, in Adam and Eve, there's a serpent. And the serpents tend to appear in Greek stories as well. Uh, I don't know why I'm showing that, but that's Orchard Island. I'm going to be talking about that uh, in a moment. Uh, bring that back in a moment. I was It was supposed to be in a serpent picture. That didn't come up. But the rooted theme of the original Greek mythology is that sacred apples, um, they have sacred apples are picked and stolen from the Garden of Hera. All experiences of unconditional love are denied and are replaced by desires, temptation, possession, and greed. So the Garden of Hera is very much similar to the Adam and Eve story. I'm wondering that's where it came from. And together, religions call all of these artists and expressions as their own indulgence in desire and temptation. And of course, the Christians and I think other religions have one word for it, sin. Now, by the 16th century, it was still only a few people, as I say, could read or write. So these artists could get away with these expressions because this is what people interpreted rather than what was written and ascribed in books. Most people relied on their learning and their wisdom and their knowledge coming from visual images. So the artists and sculptors were very powerful and influential people. And the visuals from what we call bohemian artists and sculptors seem to be very much more memorable than any visuals that were forced onto the people from their teachers, especially their religious teachers. Now, it seems that through these bohemian art people, many people actually picked up and verified their own personal faiths, beliefs, and stories. That's why though people go to church, they go to mass, and they follow the rules and all that, the inside their heart is the images of the story and the artists that they are remembering the most, because that's what... It's art and sculpture and uh, visions I, that hold emotions. We actually become attached to them and their memories that stay with us for life. Stuff that we read rarely stays with us for life, I don't think. So, uh, and of course, what's passed on from parents and some of the stuff from formal teachers because they'll break down and take their suits and gowns off and share their personal experiences when they can get away with it as well. Now, from well, viewing these Renaissance arts, many people start to, to interpret and assume that Eve gave an apple to Adam. Let's see if I can find a picture on this. Um, after being tempted by a snake. So let's see. I should have. There we go. There's the uh, dear old snake doing some temptation. Uh, so there's an assumption there that Eve gave an apple to Adam. So never trust the snake. I, <laughs> I could probably put together a whole nature folklore performance of love stories from apples as they are said to be especially, apples are said to be very aphrodisiac, especially for men. Now, let's not forget uh, stories related to cider and mead because both uh, are made from apples and honey. Uh, cider, not so much from honey, of course. and But so honey and water can be a good fermenting base. Apples or something made from apples seems to be connected to several stories of temptation. And also the temptation is accompanied by beliefs in achieving immortality. Old uh, apple folklore says that the experience of apples, the intense experience, is related to immortality. Now, Sleeping Beauty is perhaps the best known story we might know when Snow White was lured into eating a poison half of the apple that the witch, uh, the, the witch was also eating, and the half she was eating was for her own immortality. That's a nice old picture of the uh, Sleeping Beauty there. Now, within the apple temptation stories, it seems to be a story of our surrender to curiosity. And it's, you know, we can relate this to cats as well. When we surrender to curiosity... That seems to be what leads us to pain, sorrow, and even greed. But 
when we're experiencing pain, sorrow, and greed, what are we doing? We're learning to become human. We're learning what it is to be human. And there are lovely sto Apple stories about, also about inspiring our imagination, our wisdom, and the passions of discovery of love. Now, Apple's um, a famous one as well. It's giving the apple to the teacher. There we go. There's a lovely apple to the teacher. Where is the apple? Yeah, there's the apple to the left of the teacher there. And that's uh, by tradition in a way. It's, it's supposed to be to thank teachers, to encourage, you know, thanking the uh, teacher for sharing their inspired wisdom. You know, that's teacher's pet. <laughs> but please, teacher, keep doing what you're doing and encourage us with your inspired wisdom that's the teacher and the apple thing anyway but after you're inspired you know um one thing i love is getting hold of a crisp apple there we go picking a crisp apple in fact whilst i've got that up i'm going to put this into my background while you're swooning over the apple i should have something there let's put that one into the background um i think i'm going to put the first apple into the background that would be much more fun there we go, because oh no, it's gone. All right, and but have you have you ever found yourself when you pick an apple like that and bite into it, and a lovely, fresh, lovely, juicy, crispy apple, uh, that suddenly it's a moment of timelessness, of of incredible inspiration. It's a time to make a wish, and uh, but moving away from apple stories, I'm going to bring up something from B. Smith. Um, I, uh, I've been meaning to put this on for a few weeks. We cancelled the Heritage Week, and I should have my seat a bit further over for this. There we go. I love that's the first apple for picking there. Uh, and I haven't got a, a video up yet, but I'm going to bring her video up uh, now. And her and Tony, they have been uh, putting together a wonderful garden uh, together. Uh, I think they were inspired when they came to our labyrinth gardens, which are from us no more. So uh, it's no, it's not coming up. Yeah, there it is. It's ready. Anyway, let's show. There's a lovely picture from. It was B and Tony's anniversary recently, and there they are wandering around some photographs in the garden. So I'll have that whilst uh, putting this. So this is a few minutes break from me as B takes you around the progress of her and Tony's garden that they're making and dedicating into a Bridget garden. So here we go. Good morning on a very sunny and warm Saturday. We have been creating here a Bridget's garden and Bridget is very, very much strongly a part of Ireland's heritage. The garden basically was made from scratch since this past February. Uh, what was in this space before was uh, flag iris, comfrey, and lots of rushes and lots of rocks. And some of those rocks became this rockery at the south end, which has ladies mantle in it. It has the rockery rose called the bride. It also has a plaque with some poetry, as it turns out was from Tony's mother's favorite poem. Tony always wanted to have poetry in the garden. And this birthday gift from Siobhan McMahon and Wahin McMahon was one of the first elements adding poetry to our garden. Lots of thresholds. Thresholds are very much the legends of St. Bridget. She was said to have been born between indoors and outdoors. She's also considered to be the patron of smiths and so we have this little metal bee here as a nod to the smithcraft patronage um, our house also was formerly the home of someone who did tin smithing as part of his his work tony wanted to create an enclosed space to give the idea of sacred space out of bamboo sticks he has created this palisade and it is full of sweet peas so it's an incredibly scented at this time of year the garden is a work in progress where you see the dianthus over there 
those are annuals that we've put in. But this autumn, we will be putting in St. Bridget's anemones. And we have got some sheep's wool from another neighbor. So that um, apparently they're very slug delicious. Um, sheep's wool does keep slugs off your cherished plants. Uh, you have barrage here. When it was under construction, Tony planted a lot of barrage and phacelia. And uh, that meant we could kind of control some of the volunteers or the unwanted volunteer plants while everything was coming into being. Uh, there's lots of sunflowers. Bridget the goddess is a solar goddess. And so we had to have, have them. And they're also kind of a Cookson family emblem. Paths, which are not uh, completed, we're waiting on more sand and bark. The layer of newspaper, then cardboard, then bark, and it's worked really, really well. The milk thistle here, which is a medicinal herb, and of course Bridget is associated with healing. This blue salvia, for instance, came from Lawhen House Open Prison. They have polytunnels where you can go and buy plants, and they really have been very helpful to us for filling the gaps. Look at this salvia. Look at the heart shape, <clears throat> leaves on it. Salvia, you think of salve. These are also, they're a sage plant. And both healing and wisdom come together in these beautiful, beautiful plants. We've had so much community support from friends on this project. This sign was made for us by a neighbor, David Mon, and then Siobhan McMahon, uh, used a wood carving tool to put in a Bridget's cross and bees. We have another friend who is making a bench, which will be under that twisted hazel up at the top of the garden. Uh, the idea is to have lots of little plants and you can just meander around. This archway we have fuchsia and associated with abundance. Another example of bringing poetry into the garden is a poem of mine called Bridget's Mantle, and it's been printed on a non-PVC banner and put on the eastern facing archway. This planting was my idea. The idea of the red gladioli is to create the illusion of tongues of flame. Bridget is a fiery goddess, fire and water. And we haven't got to a point of getting water, a water feature in here, but this time next year, there will be many changes. As I said, it is a work in progress. There's golden fever few there. And then we've got the rushes. I wanted them left at least one lot. This is what we weave the Bridget's Crosses from on her feast day on the 1st of February. And up here, again, using the rocks that were in this area, we've another rockery there. There's another one of the rock roses, the bride in there. It's no longer flowering. And that's where the bench will go. And we'll actually be able to this is south facing it's very sunny but that's always going to be a nice shady space to just sit and smell the flowers because over there tony has been planting in lots of lavender so it will be a really lovely scented garden there's honeysuckle here on this bit of bog oak and yeah there's brambles brambles are considered sacred to bridget and uh, you kind of can't get rid of them here. Uh, our townland is actually translates as um, the Briary Place. It's very appropriate. And again, we like having the combination of plantings with wild things as well. That's our introduction to our Bridget's Garden. Have a good one. Well, wow, thanks very much uh, for that, B, and uh, the work of Tony as well, uh, Tony Cookson. We'll have B back on with uh, poetry and B 
No, uh, well, he may have the poetry. Be with her poetry and Tony with the stories. Thanks. A big red uh, I'll make a start on Avalon stories. Uh, need to get with that. And I think I'll get a virtual background that fits into this because we're into the mystical stuff now. There we go. And uh, so Avalon stories it is. There is a folklore myth stories of apple orchards on islands from Neolithic, Megalithic, Bronze and Iron Ages and from medieval times. And there's some... I had a picture earlier. There's an uh, apple and honey tails connected to Orchard Island, uh, which is um, it's on Loch Mila. Let's see if I can get that Loch Mila thing that was uh, up. It came up by mistake. Uh, I think this is it. There we go. That's Orchard Island. There is in the, the only island there is in Loch Mila. And uh, there's quite a tale with that one. I'll be very brief. Uh, that uh, Lazier, uh, there's a Saint Lazier that was, uh, was the um, daughter. Uh, I'm losing. I forgot most of the story. I haven't told it for many years. Uh, I'm trying to think of the abbot of uh, Corona there. Anyway, he, he had a daughter named after her, uh, Lazier, uh, spelled differently. But Lazier herself, uh, she was looking after and caring for all the apples and the bees and the hives. And um, uh, there used to be a, a kind of a chieftain gathering uh, that was there. And there was a, a Scottish bard that came. And this seems that any person with the name of Finn, from Finn McCall onwards, even though uh, Finn is the blonde one or the light one, uh, was a bard and he was trying to woo uh, Lazier and he was carrying gifts and uh, he'd actually stolen these gifts from the fairy world anyway. And I can only remember two of them at the moment. There was a, a lovely comb for combing her beautiful hair. But the most important was there was the Rose of Sweetness. And the Rose of Sweetness, it never wilted. And there was always pollen there for the bees. And uh, that pollen, uh, the bees also pollinated the apple trees and it meant having an abundance of apples on Orchard Island along with the bees. And Finn actually showed Lazier how to put the two together. And uh, he would visit, uh, I don't know if he was a pest or not, but he would visit every day. And uh, this combination that he had done, put together with the honey and the apple and the fermentation of that, and he started coming to her every day from New Moon. And uh, and then by the time of the full moon, she was getting the full effects of this honey and apple concoction, which we know as mead. And when it was full moon, the passion started. And that is basically what a honeymoon is. It, it used to be a tradition, and the monks, uh, Saxon monks, definitely the first Christian monks, would encourage this, that any uh, married union couple, they would stay in a room uh, at the monastery uh, for two weeks of drinking mead so that they would actually, uh, their passions would come together and consummate their marriage. So that's what the honeymoon's all about, if you didn't know. Anyway, Avalon in Somerset... Um, uh, that's uh, bring back what I started with there. There we have the tour there and the apples. Known to millions of people around the world. Well, Glastonbury tour at the back there is. And Avalon is said to be uh, a place of divine joy, of course. Um, and the Glastonbury tour has kind of got that story as well. But Avalon's also known as being a place of apple by its actual name. And this comes from, there's a Welsh word, uh, afal, A-F-A-L. And how the apple word, word got to Wales is quite a story, too, because a lot of the Welsh language is very similar to the Cornish, came over from Brittany, came in that direction. And uh, it also went up northwest, Northumbria, up into Pickland in Scotland. But um, apple is also incredibly close to a Germanic and Saxon word, which is apfel, A-P-F-E-L, -A apple. So there's a tension right now for me to move into Arthur and Merlin's stories, but I'm not going to do that today. 
uh, there's, there we go. There's a bit of Arthur there. <laughs> uh, but I would like to talk about the creation of Avalon a lot more. What I did not tell in the Isle of uh, Logmila story, in the Orchard Island story there, uh, was how actually that island, oh, let's go back to it. I told you about uh, brief, I uh, tried to be very brief because I've forgotten a lot of the story now. But um, how was Orchard Island created? You know, how did they actually get there as the sole island right there uh, in Loch Mila there? Now, I, I think that's absolutely uh, fascinating story. Now, during the tales of the deeds of the Tour de Donna, there's tales of uh, three characters known as the Sons of Turin, T U I R. E A M, and uh, these were also the sons of the half two of the Don and, and half of more embrace. And uh, he happened to have a wife called Bridget, which is who's assumed to be named after the goddess Bridget. Now, fuller and older name of the Bridget translated out in English it is meaning fiery arrow, and that's also believed to be the ancient um, description of lightning is the fiery arrow. Now, Turium, as in what we call the suns, uh, Turia is an ancient name that translates out as thunder. So there we have the three sons of Bridget, sons of Turin, who were the thunder who were born out of the lightning bolt woman of Bridget. Now, that's as far as I'll go with that mythology before, because it will just take me too far away from apples and Avalon. Uh, though I've not seen it in text, what I've heard from the stories of these sons of Turin was more an allegiance uh, with the Fomorians, as they did many deeds against the Tour de Danum folks to get the approval of Fomorians. Now, one of these deeds was of these menacing sons of Turin was stealing Doida or Dagda's cauldron of plenty. Now, it seems they did this about this time of year, if we follow the stories. Uh, so Dagda's cauldron isn't long after the harvest, it was overflowing as best as it can. So as the sons of Turin grabbed uh, his uh, cauldron of plenty, they tried to run with it, but this thing was bubbling over. It was really full of plenty uh, after they stolen it. It was just seemed to these sons, it was just getting heavier and heavier and heavier, and it was slowing them down. And they weren't really big lads, I don't think. And there was the big doy, the dagger. He was catching up to them. So they threw Douglas Cauldron into Loch Mila. And uh, the overflowing from the cauldron quickly created this fertile island, which I showed you, of Orchard Island. It's Loch Mila. It's near Kiju, County Ross Common. And it's right by where composer Bartolo Calderon is buried, he, uh, close to Loch Mila too. Now, Glastonbury Avalon also has a story very similar to this. And they said that that was formed with a cauldron of plenty that was stolen and thrown into a lake. And that cauldron of Avalon story starts with a sacred gift of a cauldron of plenty that was belonging to Bran the Bard uh, from the Wales area. But this cauldron was seized by Barinthus, the charioteer, who took souls of the dead back to the other world. Now, Bran's sacred gifted cauldron it, it, as a similar story to the Sons of Turin, as uh, Barinthus chariot was bouncing along towards the lake, the secret, uh, this Brand's cauldron, it rolled off the back of his chariot, went into the lake, and as it was in the lake, this, just like uh, Dagger's cauldron, maybe the stories got crossed over, it just continued to flow and flow. And uh, as it flowed, flowed, overflowed, the contents quickly rose above the lake, above the water, and formed a fertile island and uh and when it formed uh, like with the log mealer uh, there we go it's um there we are uh, well there's nothing there what happened was apples it said that an orchard island grew on avalon because um and because the this orchard was f trees bearing apples this island formed from the contents of brand's cauldron this is what became known as the Isle of Avalon. Um, uh, the apples, uh, it's a hill of apples. So Avalon, like our local or altered island, it also had the presence of a goddess woman. There was Lazar on uh, Orchard Island. But uh, on Avalon, the goddess was uh, Seridwen, 
Sheridan. And uh, Sheridan's four sisters, she had four sisters. Well, Asia was all by herself. And uh, they are barred, came along and tagged. Uh, but they, the four sisters, uh, they didn't put up with Tegan's nonsense. They, he had a real hard time putting up with them because uh, he couldn't get any uh, any attraction from them until they went through their tests of honor because they wanted to test his honor and loyalty to Keridwan. And uh, as Keridwan was an goddess of nature and transformation through winter she also carried stories very similar to the Mor what we know as the morrigan the morrigan i forget the stories i was told of how tegid uh of him uh, it was about 50 years ago the last time i heard them i'm not sure how he was tested by these four sisters maybe cliff you know more about this than i but he was tested for his loyalty to the earth and also tested for his loyalty for observing the various seasons through the solar year and also tested for his loyalty to all life on earth. Now, I remember he was somehow tested for his loyalty to the earth itself. And as I say, and loyalty to acceptance of all the different variations of the seasons from the hot to the cold, etc., on all life on earth. And uh, I also love a saying that is, um, I once heard this, it's a variation on the teacher one, an apple a day inspires a bard to play. Now, a story I loved hearing as a child is that eating the first apple, let's go back to having a first apple. There we go. That's that first apple picture I showed you, me in front of it. And uh, this goes back to uh, what Cliff was talking about earlier. Uh, getting the first apple from the garden it symbolizes, you know, once you take that first bite, when a child takes that bite of the first apple from the garden, it symbolizes becoming human and becoming filled with human emotions. And a bard is said to serve the three strains of the three trees through their music and words uh, that are performed for our emotions. And the bard performs, as we know, we've got the... Um, John Tree, uh, Gold Tree, the strain of sorrow, John Tree, the joy, um, uh, strain of joy, and then the Sun Tree, the uh, strain of sleep, and the sleep really being the dreaming. Now, to me, Avalon seems to be very much symbolic of the dreaming. That's why we've got this dark picture here, symbolic of Avalon. And there is a mythology story that tells of the inside the apple. The inside, when you bite into an apple and you open up an apple, it's actually a conduit between our world and the other world where our dreams travel and are responded to. Going back to Cliff about the water, uh, the apple in the water. I've also heard that within apple fruits is where the she horses, the couple, the couple she could travel between the two worlds. That is really uh, uh you know, you've got to break down all barriers to uh, understand the imagery of that one. The, the, you have an apple with a capital show you go traveling between the two worlds. Anyway, that's how it's told. And this is why eating apples is said to inspire us with revelations that we manifest. We actually manifest these revelations through our waking days. Now, before potatoes in Ireland were the substance food for the winter, before apples ever came in 600 years ago, was it? Apples was the sustaining food for the winter. So this is why it's important and why there's uh, apples are revered. The apple harvest. We had August very much the barley and oats and wheat and rye. Now in apples here in September harvesting and the fruit, other fruit. But the apples especially because this is what takes us through the winter. We have the darker days where night is longer than day. And that's when we do a lot more dreaming. That's when we get a lot more revelations. That's when we get a lot more inspirations. This is when we do our planning for the year ahead, isn't it? It's when we get new ideas of how to do things better. We seem to slow down a bit, have more visions. Eating an apple is said to do that. And so... We've got all these sleeping, dreaming revelations manifesting to us that we use for our waking days. Now, some fairy stories 
they do include demons and evil people within the stories. Well, a lot of fairy stories do, don't they? Now, our imagination response to these stories, these darker stories, they seem to be the darker sides of our dreams. Now, it's very important how we respond to those. And I suggest that we do not respond to these darker perceptions in the way of being fearful. If we surrender to these darker inspirations, I, I'm not going to share the stories because it'll be on forever, but the story, there's a lovely story saying how this dark veil of the night of our sleep, it's like a womb situation, I suppose. Eventually, it lifts us up to reveal the light within our dreams, and that's the light that guides us. And that's why I say, don't be fearful of the dark, because that dark is pointing to the light. And uh, where we can use our inspirations, you know, it's as if we need that dark side to seed our ideas. And that to me is all symbolic of what Avalon is all about. And there we have that dark imagery uh, rising up from that is our light that we follow through with. Now, included this is a vision we may have when we bite into a crisp apple. And here's a lovely barrow of crisp apples. And there's a box of crisp apples there. And I feel, uh, I love that sensation. Psst, you, know, you get this fragrant uh, kind of vapor uh, seems to smother us and enchant us. And I find that is an amazing momentary experience to bring us in a world of revelations into the realm of Avalon even. That undefinable space where the spirit within apples takes us. Now the spirit is said to be strongest, as Cliff pointed out, at Suwan. And many people call that Halloween today. So, and one of the things uh, for protection through Sawan, um, uh, still happening in some places, is to encourage children to go to bed with an apple at night around Sawan, especially at Halloween now, and then place the apple under a pillow. Do I have this? Yeah. There we go. That's uh, there we go. Uh, that's a lovely explanation. Put the apple under the pillow. And your dreams and wish to eat the apple in the morning. Later, people can use apples in games. The idea of uh, the old tradition is uh, for children to put the, the apple under the pillow. So when they get the dark dreams, they're not in fear. They're not bad dreams. They're not being troubled by fearful and troublesome spirits. So an apple under a pillow at any time is said to enhance good dreams, protective dreams, and loving dreams as well. Now, before I love this, I love the story of the apple fruits having a trinity of color. Uh, here we go. There's three apples, and I was saying, then we bring in some gold ones there, as well as the green and the red. So there we have the green, the color of birth and our infancy, yellow for our maturing, like the sun across the sky, and red for the sun as the apple sinks into the sunset at the time of our apple harvesting. Now, with them bathing in the uh, bathing in the face breath book that I showed earlier, uh, there is an almost tale of the trees, and in that tale of the trees, there is a section quote the apple, and it just covers a, bit, a fair bit of what I've uh, just said. And Claire Roach, she's actually um, she's with us today. Uh, she's composed some lovely jolly. And enchanting harp music to go with us, but we don't have a very good recording of it this yet in live video. Uh, anyway, I'm going to go to your comments before I talk about this a bit more. And um, love the Harley Moon story, said uh, Terry Slack, and uh, she also enjoyed the garden story. And and then uh, I must have they both work very well on this, Terry, uh, Terry uh, both Tony and B. And uh, there we go. Thanks, B and Tony. There's Cliff and Claire there is. B and Tony, your guns, stunning. Just delighted to see such beauty. And Bridget Foy is commenting on B and Tony's garden. That's lovely. Uh, great. Now, as I was saying, uh, I was talking about, quote, the apple which to me sums up a lot of the um, a lot of what I was saying about Avalon. And without further ado, I should have, it's an old video of just me reciting it. It's not the best thing. I wish there was a music one. We'll get this done sometime. So somewhere here is, quote, the apple. Did you know 
that within every apple there lies something waiting to surprise. Now instead of cutting down, slice through and watch a star appear for you. At harvest time, each day on my ladder, I reach closer towards the sky, picking apples, filling barrels, for mead, for cider, and of course to make apple pie. But I am done with the apple picking for now. Time for winter sleep that no longer nights allow. The scent of the apples calms me and calls me. What will my dreaming allow me to be? In that twilight, before sleep, I can see apples appear and disappear, every one with perfect skin. Aye, this was the great harvest we all desired, to nourish us through the winter, but oh, I'm now tired. But there are voices singing, apples, apples, look, here's our treat, big and small, and they're all good to eat. One side red, the other side green. Russets and coxes all washed clean. But where are the crab apples? Well, they're still out in the wood. Bitter for the big folk, but for us they're quite good. So come on ye, let's gather them up, make jelly with honey and mead for us to sup. And from that mead we'll reveal stories. Of darkness to light, monsters who became angels to guide us through the light. Night. A poet once visited, told us of his longing, seeking for the dream, his desire for courting. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone, and kiss her lips and take her hands. We walked with him among the long dappled grass, and plucked till time and times are done those silver apples of the moon and the golden apples of the sun. And through a moment's smile, he shared more wisdom with us for a while. Peering above his spectacle steamed as we giggled, burped and beamed. Mm -hmm. But there is that tree, with the leaves so green, and here are the apples <coughs> that hang in between. And if I picked these two apples, do you know what I would do? I would shine them up, and I'll give one to you and one to you. <laughs> <laughs> now, so there we have that, um, uh, my sort of spoken version of... Um, uh, of my uh, apple pea, uh, apple apple poem there, quote the apple. And uh, Kate was saying here something in Iowa, the apple season is starting. They're just getting uh, ready there. And uh, as you see on that quote the apple, I actually stole a bit of uh, WB Yeats. And uh, I've got a little bit of treat on that, I think. It's worth following up. Uh, and here is actually Claire uh, performing that to music, uh, the uh, reference there to the golden apples, etc. is... Um... Oh. Flickering out 
castle on the fire And someone called me by my name It had become my dream A uh, wonderful bit of uh, Claire there with uh, the Song of the Wandering Angus and the reference, uh, central reference to apples there. Two things I, I got it going before. There's two things I pointed out. That was actually performed uh, beside Loch Mila, where the uh, Orchard Island is, and that was performed on a windy September day. So thank you, Claire. May not be the best technical performance, but it's definitely in the atmosphere of today. So it's an absolute thrill uh, to include it. Now, what a lovely festival coming up uh, in Ireland. Uh, it's, it's the Club Mel Apple Fest, as I was mentioning earlier. Uh, they haven't got their brochure. I think they're having the brochure launch today. Uh, but uh, I'll do what I can with uh, what I've got uh, in case you're in Ireland. I know this is their the cover, the front cover of that that they've got. And so it gives you the website address there. And uh, I know some of the things they're actually not doing so much with Apple. Surprisingly, what they're doing, they've got a lot of they're having a honey competition there. And they're also going to have workshops on how to make the costumes for the winter uh, with the straws, the leftover straws from the barley, the oats and the wheat. Uh, so that's to help you through the sawan, uh, through the um, straw boys, mumming and uh, even um, wassailing and so forth so there's a lot of workshops about that and uh, so that's the uh, clomel apple fest is in tipperary uh do i have a date i think there was a date on that um so they have the brochure launch today there we go 22nd to 25th of september the end of the, uh, that i haven't been to one yet i'm gonna have to get to one sometime uh fascinating area tipperary because bournemouth is the big thing there Bulmer's brand actually uses 17 different species of local apples and there's eight brands of cider made there in Clonmel anyway and the only other cider brand I know from there is Longways Cider from nearby Carrick on Shure uh, that's on the way to Waterford from Clonmel but there must be more now uh, as I say previous years we did have enthusiastic interviews with the organizers Teresa Gushbauer and uh, Lynn Mather 
uh, of the Clonmel Apple Fest, but unfortunately, they're not with us uh, this year. Uh, do I have any pictures? No, I did have something. Anyway, I showed you a couple of pictures of that. As much more I'd like to share with you about Apple, such as their origins, how Apple spread around the world, the temptation of the white goddess, the white hag, uh, Gronya, Anya, Bera, Bowen, how they're all involved in it, and not the white goddess that was adapted for the wicker people. But along with those are temptation stories like Conler on Yushnik and Oshin on Tara. Uh, but I think I can serve a bit of time to share a bit about wassailing. I don't have the pictures. I cover wassailing during the winter. Uh, ben short wassailing is the blessing of apple trees to pray that they yield many apples for the next harvest. And the origin of the folklore tradition is said to be from Saxon, brought to Britain when they arrived in the fourth century. And they said, some stories actually say the Saxons were invited by the Britons, the people of, at the time, that were being pushed into Wales and into Cornwall uh, because they, would, they wanted an allegiance with the Saxons. Um, and they preferred that. So this was the kind of breakaway of Wales and Cornwall from the tribes uh, of Scotland and also Ireland. So they wanted that allegiance with the Saxons. Anyway, it's a long story. But because of the advancing skills in apple orcharding uh, that was shared with the Welsh and even some Scottish tribes eventually, wassailing was held, traditionally held on the 12th night of Christmas, according to the Julian calendar, the Roman calendar. And that was 17th of January, which is, well, that's the Gregorian calendar day. And that date uh, may have been fixed after the 7th century, 300 years after the arrival of Saxons. But this was a time when the Saxons became Christian, became very involved with monastery creation, scribing, and education. But the Saxons still followed their customs and traditions alongside the Rome-instructed Christian dates and traditions too. But how and when the Saxons and other people bless their apple trees before Christians coming is totally unknown. Um, and I'm losing my voice because I'm getting near the end. And as I'm saying, as apple tree blessing was was hail to the branches, the roots, and the people present, and it's all aligned to Christian dating. And wassailing and other traditions have had quite a rocky road as well, especially during the times of the Puritans, 16th century onwards, they tried to ban wassailing. <coughs> Excuse me. There was a rural revival that got up and going in the 17th century, though, increased it the 18th century, and um, and that was it's probably the 18th century. The wassailing ended up on the 17th of January. So uh, they faded away. Wassailing in the early 20th century faded away then when there was a British folk revival in the 70s we had it back again and uh, so I'll talk about that in January uh, and it's spreading all over again and there's attempts to bring that over into the southeast island and I think even well they do Clonmel the Apple Festival includes a bit of wassailing as well so that's all I'll say about that and I'll talk about that more uh, in um Wade back in when we come up into December sometime. Anyway, as I say, I'm still not covering my expenses. I'll do the uh, hustling again. There we go. Patreon.com, uh, Woodland Bar. It might be Nature Folklore now. Uh, is through that and through, uh, if you prefer cards, buy me a coffee. Uh, Nature Folklore, if you'd like to send some cash in an envelope, message me and I'll tell you where to send it to. So all... Uh, you're a pound a week um, or a dollar uh, a, a month, I mean. It all helps to keep it afloat. Thanks very much for those that support that. And um, now, uh, many thanks for your support, as I say, coming up on the Nature Folklore. We're away next uh, week again. This is getting frequent, isn't it? We're off to Scotland to see uh, my family. First time for a few years, first time before since we well before COVID, so that's going to be exciting. And then back again, 18th of September, for a proper introduction to the new side project of uh, Nature Folklore and the Wells. Um, what have we got? Have I, do I have a picture? No, I don't. Uh, yeah. No, that's Apple Pillow. Never mind. 
uh it never came up again um anyway an introduction to the new side project holy world's revival and then on the 25th of september i do commence our eight week so on series again and uh it'll things are going to be a little different how i do it this time but here we go there's nice symbolism for that uh, eight weeks and the first three is going to be witches cauldron and ale and that's going to kick off from the 25th of september and then when it's going to be eight Sundays. Now, actually, Nature Folklore is going to change format a bit. What I'm going to be doing because of uh, requests, instead of like this is going into 90 minutes again, I'm going to be splitting each episode into two by 30 to 40 minute broadcast. So the first one's going to be 4 p.m. on Sunday Irish time. And then the follow up is going to be 6 p.m. on the following Tuesday. And then the weekly uh, Holy World's Revival will be 7 p.m. each Thursday. Now, the Sunday edition, as much as possible, will always be live. But the Tuesday and Thursday editions, they're going to be a mix of live and pre-recorded. Uh, though I'll try to be around as much as I can on pre-recorded editions so I can respond to your comments when they're live. Uh, right, I've got stuff up that shouldn't be up. Let's get rid of that. Uh, comments, we got a couple of uh, comments come in And Claire, thank you for your lovely music And uh, Terry found that a real treat as well Thank you very much uh, Thank you very much for your comments there And thank you for contributing the polls That, that I'm adjusting around to now uh, They asked you for preferences of the time, days uh, And length of show so thank you for that. It's helped me to uh, guide on that. Any other comments, uh, do throw them up for me, please. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you to B and in the background, Tony B. Smith there showing around the garden. Uh, and if you're watching this as in the, the archive, do keep commenting. And uh, I do return from time to time to answer the comments. I'll put up the link uh, for subscribing on the YouTube uh, channel, the new one. The Holy World Revival, please help on that. Get the numbers up because I want to get it its own proper link. Uh, I need a, I need another 80 people, I think. 70 to 80 people to subscribe before I can get that. There is bell icons on the YouTube uh, channel here. Remind you what's on the next Sunday sessions as well. I think that's all I've got. Uh, if you've got any uh, questions or comments, it's been lovely to be with you again. So I uh, just leave me to wish you a wonderful, safe week, full of uh, wonder, inspirations, lots of chanting, enchantments, especially if you're biting into apples. So that's as much as uh, I can give this week, I think. As someone just spoke here uh, in the comments. Uh, let's see if I can catch this one before I go. And Terry, enjoy the show. Another wonderful, appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks very much. Another wonderful show from Terry there. Thank you very much. Thank you all of all you. Um, play well. Um, be enchanted. Until next week, that's all I got. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Okay.